This is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Richard Rothstein. Richard is one of my personal heroes as the author of The Color of Law, a book which exposes the real history of federal involvement in the segregation of housing. He's also a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So welcome, Richard Rothstein. So I remember attending a public housing conference in a major city in the South in 1970s. And I was shocked to hear that public housing was still segregated. I thought, how can that be? This is a federally subsidized property. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Uh, the federal government implemented so many racially explicit policies to create a segregated society. We have a national myth a rationalization we give ourselves to excuse ourselves from dealing with the fact that we are in effect an apartheid country. The myth is that we have something called de facto segregation, something that happened by accident because of private bigotry or private businesses or people wanting to live with each other of the same race or economic differences. Uh, it's, there's no basis in reality to it. Uh, in fact, there were so many federal, state, and local policies racially explicit designed to segregate this country that we have an unconstitutional system of racial boundaries. The federal government, every time it implemented one of these policies was violating the Fifth Amendment. State and local governments were violating the 14th Amendment. These are civil rights violations that we have an obligation to remedy. And we've never undertaken that obligation as we must as American citizens. So tell us about how federal policy in the New Deal was designed to segregate housing. Well, um, I'll begin with one of the major policies. It actually ramped up uh, more in the Fair Deal of President Truman, but it started in the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt. And this was a program of the Federal Housing Administration and after World War II, the Veterans Administration to suburbanize the entire country with white working class and middle class families only. Uh, the, everywhere in the country, all white suburbs were created, uh, single family homes uh, on an exclusive basis for whites. African-Americans were prohibited from participating in this program. Uh, perhaps the most famous of them is Levittown, east of New York City, uh, but they're everywhere. I don't want you to think that Levittown was an exception. They're in every metropolitan area. The builder, William Levitt, could never have assembled the capital to uh, build those 17,000 homes and buy the land. Uh, the only way you could do it was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, requesting a federal bank guarantee for uh, his loans to buy the land and build the houses. And in order to get that guarantee, he had to submit detailed plans, the uh, construction materials he's going to use, the architectural design of the homes, and an explicit commitment required by the Federal Housing and Veterans Administrations, never to sell a home to an African-American. The FHA and VA even required that he place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. This was an explicit racial commitment uh, requirement of the federal government. It wasn't the action of rogue bureaucrats. The Federal Housing Administration had a manual distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the applications of builders like Levitt for federal bank guarantees. The manual said you couldn't have a federal bank guarantee for a development that was going to sell homes to African-Americans. You couldn't even have a bank guarantee for a development that was going to be all white, but located near where African-Americans were living, because that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's a quote from the federal manual. This was written policy. Uh, in, in my book, The Color of Law, I have a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall that was constructed by a developer of an all white project in Michigan. 
required by the federal government in order to guarantee his bank loans to separate his project from a nearby African-American neighborhood. And when he built that wall, the FHA guarantees his bank loans. Well, that policy, and we could talk about so many of these, that policy heavily determines the racial landscape of today because those homes and suburbs all over the country uh, were inexpensive. They were for returning war veterans uh, in Levittown and in many of the others in every metropolitan area. Small homes, 750 square feet. Uh, they sold for about eight or $9,000 in the mid 20th century. In today's inflation adjusted money, that's about $100,000. Well, those homes never sell, for, no, no longer sell for $100,000. Uh, you can't buy a home in Levittown for $100,000. Uh, they sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in some parts of the country. Those hundred thousand dollar homes now sell for a million dollars or more. The uh, white families who bought those homes gained wealth from the equity appreciation of their homes. They used that wealth to send their children to college, to uh, take care of temporary emergencies, medical perhaps, or temporary unemployment. They used it to subsidize their retirements, and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. Well, African-Americans were prohibited from participating in this policy. Uh, on average, African-American incomes today are about 60%, 60% of white incomes. You'd think that uh, if there's a 60% income ratio, there'd be a 60% wealth ratio as well. People can save the same amount of money from the same incomes. But in reality, while there's a 60% income ratio, African-American wealth is only 5% of white wealth. And that's the 21st century or 21st century legacy of uh, the unconstitutional policies uh, that the federal government followed in the mid 20th century. Uh, so this is current history as well as uh, ancient history. It determines the landscape of today. And we have an obligation to remedy it, to redress it, uh, because this policy was unconstitutional uh, when it was created and its unconstitutional effects persist to the present time. I want to go deeper into how it's affecting African Americans today, but I'm very curious about something. How did you get interested in the whole topic and how did you decide to write this book? Well, it's a long story, but I'll make it brief. Uh, I was an education policy writer. That's what I knew about was education policy. And I read a Supreme Court decision in uh, 2007. Uh, in which the uh, Supreme Court prohibited the school districts of Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington from uh, implementing a very, very token school desegregation plan. And uh, the controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, he explained that it's true the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated, but he said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. That's actually true. He was, it was a wise observation on his part. But then he went on to say, in this opinion, that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated de facto for the reasons I described before, private bigotry, actions in the private economy, people wanting to live with each other with the same race, income differences. He said the government had nothing to do with it. And he said, if the government didn't create segregation, the government is prohibited from taking any action to redress it. Well, I read this decision and I remembered uh, reading about something some years before in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the two school districts involved. In Louisville, Kentucky, there was a, a white homeowner in one of those single family, all white suburbs, a single family home, all white suburbs. The white homeowner had an African-American friend living in the center city of Louisville. The African-American friend was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife, a child, um, uh, wanted to move to a single family home, but nobody would sell him one. And uh, the white uh, uh, homeowner then bought a second home in this suburb and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry white mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to stop it. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop it. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition for having sold a home to an African-American family in a white neighborhood. And I said to myself, uh, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. 
if the police, the criminal justice system, the courts are mobilized to enforce racial boundaries in Louisville. So I began to look into it further. I found that there were hundreds and hundreds of cases all across the country, east, midwest, west, as well as the, the south and border states of police protected, frequently police organized and led mob violence to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased and rented in um, white neighborhoods. So um, that got me more interested in the myth of de facto segregation. I began to look into it further and I began to discover the other policies that we talked about uh, before. Interesting. You know, when we think back to the 1960s and the uprising in a sense of people against what they had been through to that point. And now we fast forward to 2008 and we thought a black president, this is fantastic. And now here we are again, it seems like we are back to where we started in 1960. Tell me about what you think about that. Well, I think it's a mixed situation. Uh, in many ways, we haven't made much progress. Certainly mass incarceration and uh, police abuse is uh, no better than it was in the past. But in one other respect, we're having a more accurate and passionate discussion about race than we ever have had before in American history about the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow. We had 25 million Americans participate in Black Lives Matter demonstrations uh, this past summer and spring. Uh, most of those participants were white. This was inconceivable just a few years ago. So I'm hopeful that uh, out of this uh, new awareness and study and uh, understanding, a new civil rights movement can emerge that will make it uncomfortable to uh, maintain the racial boundaries that we have to fail to redress a residential segregation. I'm working with a group of national civil rights leaders to create uh, something that will be called the National Committee to Redress Racial Segregation. Its role will be to create and support local committees of activists uh, like the civil rights movement of the 1960s that will make it uncomfortable to maintain patterns of segregation in their local communities. It will be launched soon and uh, I am hopeful that uh, it will begin to make uh, more progress in this area than we have to this point. So what do you think, what else can we do to make this better? We have such a divide just politically within our country, which we've seen recently in the vote. So what else can be done to make our whole situation so much better? Communication seems like the key to it. Do people know each other well enough? What can be done? Well, you know, the policies to redress segregation are well known. Think tanks, uh, policy writers, uh, even uh, candidates for president uh, put out all kinds of policies to redress segregation. What can be done is to create local civil rights groups that are going to make it politically possible to uh, implement some of these plans that uh, we spin out all the time. So that's my focus. My focus is not coming up with new ideas. We know what they are. We know how to redress segregation. What we don't do is have the political will and the mobilization that's going to create that political will. And that's what this National Committee to Redress Racial Segregation hopes to do. So I'm kind of hearing that you have a two-pronged approach that's needed. One is from the federal government or from a national committee and the other might very well be a grassroots organization that starts from the bottom up. I have a friend who is working out in the San Diego area on the Sister Cities Project, and he is trying to get cities that are not really integrated strongly to work with city, people from cities who are integrated and see if we can get more communication going. Any thoughts in those areas? There are some communities the taking steps to stabilize their desegregation. There's communities that are in transition and it stabilize them. Perhaps the poster child for that kind of work is Oak Park, Illinois, which has done a pretty good job of trying to stabilize its desegregation. There are many communities uh, in, in parts of the country that are gentrifying, that are temporarily desegregated, but uh, they're in the process of displacing 
many of the former residents turning a low income segregated neighborhood into a high income segregated neighborhood. We know what the policies, again, we know what the policies are to stop that. It's rent control, it's limits on condominium conversions, it's inclusionary zoning policies that uh, uh, require new developments to get authorized, uh, must have uh, set aside units for both low income families and moderate and working class families. So again, we know what these policies are to stabilize desegregation, but without a political organization, uh, they're not going to happen. You're probably familiar with sundown towns. Certainly. Tell people what that is and then talk about just for a minute, and I know you have to go, but talk about what's happening with sundown towns today. Where they're still, are they still in effect and what's being done about that? No, they're not still in effect, but uh, they have a powerful long-term consequence. Sundown towns were places where African-Americans were not permitted to set foot in the town after sundown. And they were frequent, they were local policies. They were frequently enforced by police. There were signs at the outskirts of town prohibiting African-Americans from entering after sundown. Those policies are no longer in effect today. But what they did was they preserved an all white community as all white. And it makes it much, much harder to desegregate a community that was enforced as a segregated community for 30, 40, 50 years. So these policies all have a long-term effect. You don't turn, change them overnight. You need the kinds of policies that I described before in order to redress their segregation that was created in so many different ways by, uh, I described uh, initially in our conversation, the federal policies that were very powerful or some of them that were very powerful in creating segregation. The sundown towns is the most local of policies. And between that, there were state policies, there were municipal policies, uh, all of which were networked to create the segregation that we have today. Uh, the takeaway is that de facto segregation is other nonsense. We have an unconstitutional system of segregation because it was created and sustained and reinforced at so many different levels of government, federal, state, and local to create the segregation that we have today. Do you have any last advice for anybody who is African-American as an individual today? Do you have any advice for them? I have advice for every American, whether they're African-American or white. As American citizens, we have an obligation to remedy civil rights violations. And I hope that whites and blacks will uh, get engaged in the kinds of civil rights activity that this new National Committee to Redress Racial Segregation uh, is planning to uh, create in their local communities. Thank you so much for your participation and giving us the time to talk to you for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it.